How's it going? It's going good. How are you today? I'm doing well. Sorry about the delay. Uh, I don't I know think what was it going was my on. Fault. Um, I, I attempted to do it from the computer, and it, it's just not doing what I wanted it to do. So I do apologize. So I just had to switch devices. But we're here now, and welcome. Thank yeah, you no for joining me. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. No problem. So, Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. So I wanted to kick it off, of course, to discuss your book. Let's be clear. Uh, chronicling yeah. the constant struggle and overcoming spirit of black women. And I just wanted to know what was the motivation behind you even coming up with this idea, the concept behind your book as a whole? Yeah, so um, my wife and I, we are from Detroit. So we moved to Virginia and I was burnt out from work. I was um, I was on the salary and you know how that goes. They say you can work only up to 50 hours, but I was working 60, 65. So I took a couple months off and I was reflecting on my grandma and the relationship between my grandma and I, and she passed away 20 years ago. And I thought, let me write a book as the matriarch of the family. Let me write a book to highlight her greatness. Um, but also I'm on social media, social media. So I saw like this energy between black men and black women. And I thought about my daughter. I thought about my wife. And I said, you know what? What if I do a book, not just for my grandma, but for all black women? Because just like my grandma was a staple in my household, you know, for black women throughout my community, black women are the staple of the black community. So I figured I would do some research because I initially I thought I can just write a book, just write it. Right. Because I'm a right. black man. So I know stuff. No. And I had to like really dig into the books and really learn about. The first book I read was um, a Sada Shakur autobiography. And then I went to Bell Hooks. And then I went to Angela Davis, Sojourner. I went, I mean, Queen Ashanti, Queen Ashanti, Queen of Montarinas, Black women from Africa. So I really wanted to do research and not just write. So it took me like a year, year and a half to really research um, about some of the struggles that Black women go through. Obviously, I can speak from my perspective, but... No, I really wanted to be vulnerable and make sure I spoke intelligently about some of the topics. Absolutely. And, you know, initially when um, your wife began promoting your book as well, I thought it was strictly going to be a poetry book because the first um, it was a SoundCloud that you had a recording done of the power of her hair. And when I heard yes. that, I'm like, wow, that is dope. And just to have it yeah. performed. But it's the book is far more than just poetry. What made yeah. you decide to have poetry as well as a commentary? Again, like the first book, like one, two of my favorite people is Malcolm X and Asada Shakur. If you look at Asada Shakur autobiography, in between every chapter of her life, she has poetry. So the first poem in my book is called What Is Left. That comes from Asada Shakur's book. I just flipped it and did like my rendition of it just to highlight black women in general. But she was talking about her personal pain. So, um, yeah, so Asada Shakur means so much to me. And for her to still be breathing this liberated air in Cuba, you know, um, as a freedom fighter who fought for us alongside the Black Panther Party, um, this book was dedicated to her for sure. So that's what gave me the motivation to use my um hip hop poetry sort of but also uh pay tribute to a black woman who who means a lot to me who I've never met but I know her impact was like very strong. Oh absolutely and uh you kind of give us a a lot of background history even when explaining the different topics that we as black women uh go through and you refer to us as sisters and brothers in your book and a, a lot of things really spoke to me when I read the book, but the chapter that hit closest to me would be chapter nine and how we as women try to do everything. And mm. when you don't, people look at you as being selfish. If you actually, you know, say the words, I need some me time. And honestly, I wanted to thank you because it helped me realize that I owe somebody an apology because I remember a, a specific conversation we were having and she was saying that, you know, she didn't need to be a mother or a wife. She just needed to be herself. 
And I'm like, how could you as a mother ever say such a thing? It's so selfish. But it was mm -hmm. before I was a wife. It was before I was a mother. And so I couldn't understand her perspective. Um, but seeing that when I was doing too much, it landed me in a hospital. I understand it fully now that it's okay to take that personal self-care and uh, appreciate it. Because if you don't, you, you're literally killing yourself. And when you yeah, think no of question. that, when you think of that, do you think that's something that can ever fully change within the black woman? Because we are known to be such strong people that we can finally find the balance. Yeah, I believe so. But I believe it's going to take a, um, help from black men, too, because we have to break down these um, gender roles specifically when it comes to the load that, that um, black women carry. So I'll give you a prime example. When we moved to um, Virginia, I was off of work for, the, the plan was just a couple of months before my son got, you know, it was like some, some racism that we experienced and we had to adjust. But so initially my wife started working right away. I was at home. I was a stay at home dad for the first time ever. So here we are. I, start, I was working 60 hours a week and, and not really, you know, I, I would come home and take my kids to the park or whatever, but it wasn't a lot. So here I am as a stay-at-home father now, and my wife is working. And I know that she could not do the same things that she used to do. So it was up to me to take out, like, make sure all the bills are paid, make sure the house is clean, make sure the kids are to the bus stop on time, right, before right. I have to drive <laughs> to the school. Um, but it really put in perspective, like, really, I seen the role or, like, the load that my wife was carrying. And it was difficult for me to make that transition first. But once I got it, it was more time with my kids. Um, it was less of a burden on my wife. And I realized like, yo, like you do too much. So when I started working, I just do the same stuff. Like we rotate days taking the kids to school. We rotate um, planning dinner because, you know, all, all I can make two years ago was breakfast. I can scramble <laughs> some eggs, but I could not really I couldn't really throw down. But here's right. the thing. She has so many recipes. Just follow the recipe. So I can essentially make the meals that she always made, but I'm doing it, you know, um, right. just following her her guidelines, you know. So, yeah, I definitely feel like black women can. It can be a paradigm shift, but it's going to take a partnership and collaboration with um, whoever that partner is. Right. And with that, do you think if you hadn't take, taken that time off, that you would be where you where you are now to realize that you know with gender roles and understanding that you both can perform the same types of roles to to balance it out within the marriage. No, it took me to um, stay still because the flip side of it is that a man's um, value is predicated on his work, right? So it's these um, from patriarchy. You look at patriarchy. We usually talk about how it impacts black women or women in general, right? We never talk about how unfair patriarchy is even, it's a dis disadvantage for a man, right? Particularly black men, because you're told that you got to work nonstop. So when do black men take care of themselves? When do we stay still to like really um, be, be in a rotation of like the family, the household, the structure, not just taking out the trash or, you know, um, cleaning some gutters here and there, but no, like the things that your wife do, I can do it as well. Cause there's no gender specific roles for these, um, duties. So, um, me being stuck for a while and, and realizing, uh, well, being a stay at home father, I realized right away, like, yo, this is hard. So I need to, first, I need to say thank you for all the years you've been doing it, you know? But also, I need to make sure I'm, I'm on it, too. Like, it's a partnership. It's a collaboration. Um, but, yeah, I, I definitely feel as though we need to take that off of black women. I, I, I can respect that. And I applaud you for even coming to the realization that it is hard. And it doesn't necessarily have to be, oh, this is a woman's job or a, a man's job when you're mm -hmm. in a relationship. And I, as I read your book, probably like a week or so before, I had seen a post where uh, a black man and an author, uh, King Benjamin, he asked, do we as black women feel protected by the black man? Because that's a mm -hmm. topic that you discuss in your book. 
for the consensus to go across the board that we as black women do feel protected. I know I feel for protected within the com you know, my relationship with my husband. I feel that protection as well as, you know, the men that are in my life. But on a global scale, do you think we can reach that level of scale? sisters or I say sisters and brothers um, I feel like we got away from community obviously I mean born and raised in Detroit like you knew everybody you knew your neighbors you spoke to your neighbors um, so I feel um, as though a lot of black women don't feel protected because you know if you're away from your 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 family structure your husband your father your brothers um, everybody's looking at each other like strangers there's no there's no there's no community anymore so, I mean, that's a difficult one because I feel like if we really, if we really value the community like we used to, we can get there. Absolutely. Um, but I, it's an insult to black men, in my personal opinion, when, when a sister says she don't feel protected. That's like that's like one of your core roles as a black man to protect women, not just your sister, not just your. You can't have this 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 value for your mom, but you disrespect other mo mothers. Like right. it doesn't, that doesn't fly because that black woman is a, a black mom to another black man. Um, so, but for me and like you, I look at black, black men and black women as family. Um, when I navigate through life, when I go to work, when I go to the grocery store, if I see an elder um, putting groceries in their car, I still help out. I don't care. Like we are family. Now there's some, some people you might not vibe with, their energy might be wrong. And I just, you know, you know, you kind of like disengage, but yeah, I go through life knowing that my black people, black Americans in particular, like we're family. All of us are family, but I'm just meant, I'm just wanted to mention like, until we get away from, it's only about me and the self, um, the self, I don't know what to call it, but and everybody else. If you, I, if you ain't my initial family, I don't care about you. I think that's a problem, but that's a mindset that we need to um, get away from if we ever want to, if black women want to feel protected and also um, black children, like our children need to feel safe. So obviously we used to let our children play up the street. And we as kids, when we, when we were kids, we would play until the lights came on. But I knew I was protected by the adults, uh, you know, a block away, two blocks away or whatever, because we were... A, a community at that point right and when you you mentioned those things as far as the structures it have broken down within the community with that the systemic racism do you think that i feel like we as a culture can take nothing and create it into something and regardless of our positions in life and while it's been hard to fight through and we have you know, miles still yet to go. Will that, is that part of the reason that we can be successful or do you think that the racism will just continue to keep us under the belt or under the, you know, lower end? Yeah, I definitely feel like it impacts us in so many ways, right? Um, but what I will say is that we got to fight through. Like you said, we're, we're people of perseverance. We can, we can overcome, we have overcame so much. So we, we can't use any excuses, but what I will say, like, I'm not sure if we, we, we actually know the tangible impact of white supremacy and racism um, and how, how directly it has broken up the black family structure. Mm -hmm. There's a, like, when I think of mass incarceration and that started like in the 1960s, you're talking about eight decades of black men being pulled away from the community, right? And then we look at today and we look at the marijuana business. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest business in, the, in, in America. Mm -hmm. But all, all the black men and black boys who are still in jail because they had some weed on them or they sold a couple dime bags, it's crazy to me. Like, the hypocrisy is, is, is bananas. So... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, white supremacy is here. It's going to be here for a while, but we can adjust. We can adjust, but it starts, it doesn't start with financial um, literacy. It actually starts with community. Because as you know, I mean, when I came up, 
we ain't have much, but that community was so rich. Like I was happy every day. Right. Like I was happy, you know, I would go outside. There's a million people outside. We all vibe the block parties. We didn't have much, but it was a bartering system. My grandma or my mom can go to, to the neighbor for sugar. They can come the next day for bread. And we were, we were good. Um, but I think it starts with the community. Absolutely. I, I do believe building a strong community will help the mindset of others and improve it to let them know, okay, yeah, we may not have everything, but things still can be better. You still can enjoy you know, life, regardless of what status you have. Um, but I do think that your book is one that all should read because when I wrote my review about it, I, I, I looked at it as like a love letter, a thank you letter, an apology letter, as well as a scolding to anyone who has disrespected a sister and to understand we're just as important that we everything we speak and say carries weight as well. And I think that's why I enjoyed it so much because it wasn't just all, you know, hearts and, 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 and you know what I'm saying? Like, it was yeah. the good, the bad, and the ugly. Like, you exposed everything, addressed everything. And you mentioned the people that inspired you to write the book. Without presenting both sides, do you think that your book will have an impact, at, at least for myself, that it's had on me, for others? without presenting, you know, both sides of it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the dope, the great thing about this book was that it wasn't about, like, I shot some videos, I put out some content. It was actually a legacy play because 10, 15 years from now, my daughter can be at Spelman, all black girls um, college, and she can say, yo, my dad wrote a book about black women. I think that's a question that's going to come up. You see all of these um, thought leaders, and they're great. And a lot of them in relationships to um, feminism or um, black women history is coming from black women. And rightfully so. Right. But at some point, the women are going to ask that women in the future, they're going to ask, like, what did black men say? What did black men feel? What was black man take on these topics? And I can at least say, you know, I, I have a legit argument. I put myself in the race just to make sure the black man um, voice and opinions on sexism, racism, microaggression in the workplace. Um, this this um, this belief that black women got to carry pain or they can they, they don't feel pain as much like we need to talk about that as black men, too. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's dope because I see some content coming out. I see podcasts. Um, we're talking about mask masculinity. We're talking about the, the black woman in particular. Um, but a book, man, for me, it, when I looked at it, to prep for your interview, I looked at my book and I felt good about it. I felt, I knew the years I put into it. I knew like some of the messages people been get, sending me like you, I thank you for your review. Like a lot of feedback has been coming back and I, and you know, it's been, the consensus has been, is like one of the, like the best books coming from a black man about black women. So I definitely appreciate it. I, I, I thank you for, you know, putting it out here in the world is something that's tangible that, you know, can never be taken away. And it, the fact that you are a black man, that you are uh, educating other black men as well as other races on how to appreciate us. Like, I think that's dope. Like it is something that needs to happen more often to come to the defense and support and I think a lot of times, sometimes we have the issue where, okay, well, we ju we're just worried about the black man advancing and we may forget about our sisters. And, but we're, mm -hmm. we're coming up with you too. And I appreciated the fact in the book, you mentioned how with women's rights, uh, how Caucasians may have, we are all in this together when it was just getting women's rights and then all of a sudden we separate, oh no, it's, it's just, I'm not, you know, uh, supporting or helping to advance your agendas. It's, it's no longer necessary. And I thought that was a good thing to share because it's true. I, yeah. um, I saw a post on Eric Jerome Dickey's uh, Twitter page and a woman had mentioned, uh, oh, that Atlanta mayor, it sure is outspoken. And what's the problem with that? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? right. 
um, and I, I even remember from myself being told, oh, you're, you're a little aggressive or uh, I was a 911 operator and they're like, you know, you can get aggressive with the callers. But if, it, if I was a male, would you say the, the same thing? If I'm trying to save someone's life, how are you supposed to do it? You got to mm -hmm. be able to reel them in. But if it comes from a, a black woman, we're often c classified as being, you know, having an attitude or, um, you know, the angry black woman complex when that's not even yeah. what it is. Even with former uh, First Lady Michelle Obama, all of the things that yep. she went through just because she spoke with conviction in support of her husband, like it's craziness. Yeah, that angry black woman narrative that has to go because it's this comparison. It's like it, it, it mirrors Eurocentric beauty standards like black women got to be what white women are. And white women in my book, I mentioned a lot how they masquerade as liberators of women when it's all about them or historically, historically, it's been about them and they leave black women out. Um, so, yeah, I just feel like we need to get to a point where black women are respected. And we got to understand their value separate from how white women are. You know, that's not that's not the history of black people. It's like judging a black man based on how white men navigate through life. No, my tone might be, um, you know, might come across as aggressive sometimes or I'm going to look a particular way. I'm not going to, you know. So if you go by Eurocentric standards, um, black women get penalized for it. And that's unfair it, it, through my eyes and. All of, I mean, we're, we're talking about diversity now. It's 2020 and we're still um, policing black hair. Are we still doing that? Are we still policing dark skin, dark skin black women? Like, how is this still a problem? Um, so, but anytime, if everything is going through the lens of whiteness, if I'm looking at you through a white perspective, which even some black people do, it's going to be a problem. So we need to identify that whiteness that might be inside of us and, and remove it because it doesn't serve us. It do not. Ser it's not serving our community, our family structure, any of it. So we need to get away from whiteness, and not white people, but just that white perspective that's that's been hazardous for our community. Absolutely. Now, in your book, you also mentioned that you have an organization um, called Soon. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I started it, man, some time ago. I was I was on the run today. I was running with a guy, and we were talking about it. I just met him, man. I recall, like, this was back in the days. I was, like, 22. You know how you'll work at, like, a restaurant job and get, like, an income t a tax return back, you know, and most people would buy, like, fancy clothes or whatever? I would donate. I would do a Salvation Army drive. I would, like, Go to a barbershop, give my, you know, because I know some some guys who cut hair, some of my best friends cut hair. I would give them money and say, hey, for all the people who um, are struggling with haircuts, all the single moms who um, can't afford to get their son's haircut every two weeks, let's do a day, let's do an event to make sure that they're taken care of. So I'm, I'm always about the community. I'm always about mentoring. So, um, yeah, I started it, I think, 2008. 13 maybe yeah 13 and i've been on the move as of late we've been to virginia and now we're in ohio so i'm trying to start it back up too but yeah it, it means a lot to me because um oh prime example would be i got a friend and she reached out and she said yo i like what you're doing with the book can you when, how can my son buy this book so mm -hmm. i gave her the link and she hit me back like a couple weeks later and was like yo he read the whole book it was it was so impactful and I feel like black men need, need to be aware of like masculinity. We need to be aware about valuing our women. Um, Malcolm Max said it best, like the black man will not get no one's respect until he first learned how to respect this woman. And I'm paraphrasing, but I know my fortune, my good fortune has come from valuing a woman and making sure she's a priority. And I'm not stressing her out with like, um, you know, stepping out on a marriage or um, lying and, and being abusive, domestic violence, those things that was, that's really impacting our community. I, I say I say this, the power of black men is so substantial. A lot of issues that goes on in the black community, if black men stopped it today and we say, no, we're cutting this out, we will flourish. Mm -hmm. But it takes some self-reflection. It takes some honesty. Um, and it takes some leadership. So to go back to my organization, that's what it's about, making sure the black man power is is reflecting 
um, mm -hmm. in, in, in our communities. And what does SOON stand for? Saving our own neighborhoods. So um, I went to school, I got a criminal justice degree and I used to volunteer with um, I, like the, po the Detroit Police Department and we would go through communities and I just realized the narrative or some of, some of the perspective of some of the officers who, who's not from our community. I knew they wasn't gonna do a good job with like policing. Um, even some of the black men or black police officers who were programmed to think away you know, often we say, hey, we just need black, we need representation in the police force. We need black police officers to patrol black communities. But again, it becomes a problem when that black person has a white ideology. Mm -hmm. So I figured to be on the grounds with the community is big for me. So that's why I started the organization. That's awesome. And especially it, that's what it's going to take. We're, we're going to have to, you know, save our own neighborhoods and it's going to take effort and work on each of our, um, you know, all of us, we have to put that work in. If, if like with the, you know, neighborhood watch associations and community uh, associations, that's what it's going to take to get our neighborhoods back to where it needs to be. To have that, that loving and and re redirect those that need to be redirected to understand. Hey, we, that's not what we're going to have over here. Um, I think that's very important. I applaud you for having such an organization. What other things do you um, have in the works? So, um, as you mentioned earlier, you know, I have like poetry in between every chapter. I'm going to put out some more videos. I think I'm going to do as many videos as possible. So this year, I know we've been caught up with the pandemic and it's been exactly. an adjustment trying to find actors and um, people to shoot the videos. But yeah, I'm definitely going to come back and put out more content, too. I got some recordings. I got some some things I want to let fly. So, yeah, like in the near future, once we get clear, I'm definitely going to put out some more content because, yeah, I fell in love with the process, and it's cool. I was telling my wife, like, like the power of her hair, for instance. Mm -hmm. I recall writing that, like, I was just, my wife was going to work, and I know, and it, actually the story came from her. You know, and obviously, you as a black woman, you know, you switch your hair up, mm -hmm. and you just you go out to work, and like you can be seven different people. Like you know, the way you the way black women switch their hairstyles up. So it's so black women are are so versatile. The beauty is like unrivaled. And I was just watching her go to work, and based on her hair, her personality or her demeanor, you know, if you you know when you get the hair right, you're good. <laughs> yeah, I, right. I always. I say, like, for most people in the world, to, to dress up, you start with your your shoes, right? You get your good shoes, and then you work your way up. For black women, I believe it starts with the hair. You get your hair right, and everything else is based on that. I'm like, yo, that's so dope. So as she would go to work, and I was jotting down, like, the different hairstyles. Um, yeah, I was so inspired. And obviously, also, for that particular piece, I wanted to push back on that narrative about you got to have hair to be beautiful. So obviously my wife did not shave off her hair, but I thought about uh, Lapita and other black women who, who went without hair. I was like, yo, I got to, it's a way I can flip this to make this creative. And that's how the power of her hair became um, the video and the poetry, the poem. Absolutely. And it's funny that you, you had already produced this. And recently Tiffany Haddish had, you know, she cut all her hair off and she said she wanted to see her naked scalp to truly feel you know, to see it. She never saw it before. She wanted to see it and, and, and embrace it. And so many people just had so many ne negative things to say about it. But when you think about it, I'm not my hair. It may enhance the person that I am, but it is not the only representation of me. And it's something that we all need to learn to embrace and to understand that no matter what my hair looks like, I'm still me. <laughs> And yeah. I think that is, is, yeah. is crazy that people are, we're still struggling to accept our naturalness. So it's, Eurocentric beauty I, standards. You were, you were ahead of the time, you know? Yeah, it's yeah. I appreciate on. that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And even for, even for men, like, I grew my hair out. I always had a low haircut with waves. When I was writing a book, I said, I'm not going to touch my hair. And I'm not sure if I would have wrote that piece if I wasn't going through my own struggle of like combating my 
my view on hair as a black man. So I went from, you know, braids to locks now. So mm -hmm. um, it's been a journey, but I definitely appreciate that that perspective because black man, most of us don't have to worry about that, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, as much as black women. So I thought I thought it would be dope to um, to put out a visual for it too. Absolutely. Um, I, and, and that seems to be uh, what a lot of artists are doing nowadays to have both uh, a, a visual aspect to their art and um, to help you visualize what you actually wrote about. I think that's pretty dope as well. And I, like I said, I, I'm looking to get into more poetry. And uh, before COVID, I was looking to host a poetry night, you know, for, you know, people oh, yeah. who already have their poetry, you know, in print to perform it for us or if, to do open mic. I mean, I think that that would be dope to, you know, still put it on somehow, some way. I'm trying to get used to this whole virtual world, but you have to embrace yeah. it at this point. <laughs> so, yeah, and but, you can um, do it. You can do it. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm, I think I'll, that's that's my next my next goal is to to host the poetry night with open mic and see what happens with it. So, thank you. I do appreciate it. Is there anything else you want to tell us about, or you know, get off get off your chest? especially like in regards to like meditation and how that's helped you to be where you're at now. Yeah. Um, and let me talk to the fellas in particular, the black woman need us. Um, I realized personally, uh, like when COVID happened, I picked up running, I started running and obviously um, with the unrest, it was just so much going on and I did not feel free as a black man. So I started running up my neighborhood. I looked on my app today in June, I ran 30 miles and in July, I'm at like 60. Mm -hmm. Black men need to find some self care mm -hmm. and we can't put it on black women. We can't put it on anyone else, but like go out, do something, ease your mind, take care of yourself. Um, I just noticed if I'm at my best, I'm at the best for my, not only myself, but my wife, my kids on the job. We got we to gotta find some peace of mind because it's very difficult to see black men being assassinated on, on video. Mm -hmm. It's very traumatic. We don't address it. We try to use the masculine energy and say, you know, I'm good. We're not good. We got to take care of ourselves. So I would say um, black man, we take care of ourselves. We can do a better job to serve our community. And we need we, we are needed. It, it can't just be strong black women or just got to be us we got to be on alongside this ride and we have to we got to get the absolutely i definitely no book promo if you like the book if you're interested buy the book but even if you haven't purchased a book or and you might you might be on the fence go to ka freeman i'm on instagram i'm also on facebook check out some of the videos you might like it absolutely i i definitely recommend it it is an eye-opener to hear both the praise and where we could, where we need to improve, not where we could improve, where we do need to improve. And I thank you for putting this out in the atmosphere. This, this is the type of energy that we need out here on a daily. So I appreciate you. I appreciate you too. I, you know, needed, my wife told me like when she put out the video, uh, you sent a comment, you t you said you showed your husband and he was like, yo, that's dope. Yeah. And that's why it, it gave me a good feeling because I know it's impacting households and um, black men and black women. I can, as a black man, I'm not an ally to black women. It's like, am I an ally to my wife, my my mother, my sister, my niece? No, we we are family. So to go back to your point, that's why I use brother and sister. You know, we're family. We need to we need to navigate as such. So, but I thank you again for your support. I really appreciate. Been on your podcast today. Well, I, I thank you for joining us, Kay Freeman. Again, you guys need to check out his book. It is a wonderful read and testimony to the Black woman, and you need to check it out. And where can we find it? So it's on Amazon right now. So when you go to Amazon, you can find it. Also, I got a couple videos on my Amazon page. So again, if you want to check out the videos and some visuals, just to put everything together, feel free to do so. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. As always, happy reading and we'll catch you guys next time.